All right, we left off yesterday. We were talking about propellers, specifically composite props. And the specific one we were talking about was the MT propeller, which we discovered was really a wood prop covered with, I shouldn't say it's really a wood prop, it just has a wood core. <clears throat> All right, one of the nice things about composite props, as far as I have researched, they do not have any vibration or RPM restrictions like the metal ones. All right, another prop we could talk about is the Macaulay. <clears throat> and the, as the one used on the, what is it called, Tim? The 760? The Sky Dancer? Yes, the Sky Dancer, <laughs> Sky Catcher. <laughs> All right, so that one, uh, well, kind of got to abbreviate this. Um, let's see, it's designed for the 162 Cessna, which uses an O200D, according to my notes. Um, the nice thing and thing I wanted to bring up about this, which is kind of cool, uh, this particular prop consists of a continuous fiber single piece design, giving it high strength as well as lightweight. Uh, just how lightweight is it? It weighs only 9.3 pounds which is 14.2 less than a metal prop or the same metal prop that was used on that actual aircraft and then there's the Ivo prop which in my thought here is, is one of the original composite propellers it's been out for a very long time and it's actually carbon fiber there's a really cool history behind Ivo Prop. I don't happen to have it memorized to the point where I could tell you about it, but I believe he was uh, developed the prop in Russia during the Cold War period. All right, let's talk about installation. Installation. We have three types of crankshafts, and this should be review. What are the three types of crankshafts? One, two, three. All right, splined. Is our number three answer? Tapered. Tapered is number two. And flanged. Uh, let's see, when would I find a taper crank? Low horsepower. Ah, very good. Usually low horsepower. Where would I find flanged? Okay, we'll put medium horsepower. And then splined? Okay. High horsepower, uh, radial engines used them. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about flanged. All right, there are several types and sizes of flanges. So, so there's not just one standard crankshaft flange size where everything is the same. Uh, Continentals are very different than Lycomings. Lycomings use bushings that are installed uh, within, the, within the flange. Continental does on the smaller engines, but not in the bigger engines. They actually use a, a smaller flange. It's actually, the it, diameter is smaller, but it's a lot thicker. So there are several different types. several types and sizes of flanges. <clears throat> this is especially true with Lycoming. So typically, typically there are bushings pressed into the flange. Let me see if we got pictures. There we go. So this one over on the right, uh, continental style, the taper, splined, this be a Lycoming. So we have these bushings. 
Yeah. What's what's weird about this picture? That one's different. All right, and so sometimes there is a different bushing, or I'm not even sure that was right. Um, that might be the mistake I'm talking about here. There's usually one that is a little bit fatter. And if you mess up, that's what happens. So let's take a look at that. Right there? Yeah. Kind of does. So let's go back to here. And I'll tell you on top. So there, bushings pressed into the flange, uh, which the bolt goes into, or which the prop goes into, which the prop bolts onto. All right, this is where you got to be careful. Um, the bushings may include a master bushing. And the reason why there's a master bushing, it's to prevent things from being clocked wrong. And by clocked, I mean installed incorrectly. If the prop should be in a horizontal plane at a certain position, then you want it in that position. Also, that ring gear, this should be put on in the proper orientation. If it's not, then what happens? Your timing, can be off. Your timing marks are off. Now, that's not a big deal if nobody's looking at the timing marks. It's just it's bad mechanicmanship, I guess, personship. Uh, there's a dowel here, but not on here. What is a dowel? I don't know what that word means. Oh, dowel? Uh, it's an index pin. So a dowel is, uh, it's just a, it's like a bolt with no threads on it sticking out. So, okay, when you built the light combing engines, you remember how, uh, so you got the, the engine on the stand and you had to put the accessory case on and there were these two metal pins that stuck out and that, gui and that guides the accessory case onto an exact spot. Those are called dowels. Dowel pins to be exact. All right, bushing may include a master bushing to prevent... prop from being clocked and when I say clocked it just means installing it in the wrong position from where it's supposed to be clocked incorrectly uh, I will say this about this is what I know about this so on a on smaller aircraft, when the engine is at top dead center, the prop is always going to I gotta kind of do this. Prop's always gonna go this way. So the number one cylinder is on top dead center. The prop would be this way. It's it's horizontal and then one bolt hole, take it off one bolt hole in the direction of rotation. And I believe the real reason why it's that way is because you hand prop old planes. They didn't have starters. So you needed it in that position to hand prop it. And so that makes perfect sense. If it was any other position, it'd be very difficult to hand prop. But then you, you move forward and you look at aircraft that have starters and they're not hand prop. The convention still follows that. I don't think I've ever really seen a four cylinder that, um, that, that that wasn't top dead center. It says top dead center in every one, it's the same spot. <clears throat> But when you get into six-cylinder engines, of course, it, it's different. But still, number one is usually in that, that particular spot. So I believe it started as that convention because of hand propping. But the books will tell you it needs to stay in that position. Because maybe you'd say, well, I'm never going to hand prop my plane. So I'm just... And some people say that. Hey, when the engine stops at top dead center, I want the prop to be perfectly horizontal. Why do you want that? Well, in case I ever belly in or something, I'll protect the prop. So can you put my prop on wrong? I'm never going to hand prop it, so it won't matter. Well, the theory is, though, that that is where the engine has been balanced, and so they want it in that position. So when I say this, I, this is, I think, what followed that, is that incorrect installation can cause vibration. Now, what happens a lot of times, a lot, is mechanics don't understand this, and they just put the, well, 
most mechanics, when they take off props, and you'll see it when you work on them, there's 100 Sharpie marks on there. And, and that's it's good in a way. So when you go to take a propeller off an aircraft, well, first of all, there's usually a spinner at right, the cone. Then there's a bulkhead that mounts to the front of the prop that holds the spinner. And then there's another bulkhead in the back that holds the back of the spinner. So you have two bulkheads and you have the prop in the middle. And you want all of this has to line up because all of the screws have to line up and everything has to be back where it was. If it's not, at the very minimum, you've got to try and figure it all out. And you'll be spending half your day, you know, okay, that, that bulkhead's got to go rotate this way and this one's got to rotate back that way. And, and um, the holes are off just enough to where it looks like if you're 180 out, it looks like it'll work, but it won't. So you need to always mark everything. So at a at worst case or best case scenario, you're just fighting to get it back. Worst case scenario, everything was balanced that way and you throw it out of balance. So everything needs to go exactly the way it was. So it's not just enough to take a prop on and say, I know that it's going to go in this direction like this. You have to know which blade was the down blade and which was the up blade because they're balanced that way. So always make sure that you end it, you mark which way it came apart. Um, but um, if you're not paying attention, which some people do, there's a master bushing, which is a different size than the other ones. And that bushing is a little fatter. And guess what that matches on the prop? A little bigger hole. A hole that's just a little bit bigger than the other ones. And the thought was, well, who in their right mind would force the prop on there? But that's what they do. So if somebody gets the prop on uh, one bolt hole or more off. And so that fat bushing is no longer going to fit in the fat hole because the fat hole's over here. So as you tighten the prop on, guess what happens to that bushing? Just gets, it just gets pressed right out the back and tends to get, and I think that's, I didn't mean to pull this one up like that, but I think that's exactly what happened right there is this particular bushing was pushed out the back. So that's probably the master bushing that was pushed right out the back because somebody put the prop on incorrectly and forced it out. And so what do you got to do? You know, you got to get, well, you're stressing out the, the crankshaft flange. You should probably pull everything apart. You should probably do non-destructive testing on the flange to see if you cracked it. Um, but the bushings are meant to be pressed in and out as long as they're done carefully. But uh, you got to pull it back all together. So don't do that. There is. There's a service instruction that tells you how to do it. But at a very minimum, you can put a bolt in with spacers and tighten the bolt up, and it'll pull it up through the spacers. But don't do that. So incorrect. Incorrect installation will allow prop to push out the master bushing. Of course, you should always install per the manual. What manual would I use? Per, per the manual. Engine manual? No. Airframe. Airframe. Aircraft. Aircraft manual. And it may reference back to the propeller manual, but all right, typical position. Install with prop horizontal when number one is at TDC. So you put, put number one cylinder, top dead center, put the prop on horizontal, then take the prop back off and rotate. So you got, this is important, take the prop off and then rotate it one bolt hole. So I should even write that because somebody just rotate it and be like, well, you said to rotate it. So take prop back off and rotate in direction of rotation. one bolt hole and that will put it 
Oops. I'll put it this way. When you're looking at it, here's horizontal and one bolt hole. So from standing at the front of the plane, that's where you're going to see it. And like I said, that was probably a convention started from hand propping. I'm going to write this just because. Oops. It's Kevin, why when they pull out spinners, they mark exactly the way the spinner was? OK, so I don't think I have a picture of a spinner. Um, let me see. So you have a bulkhead. Bulkhead's a Navy term for a wall. Bulkhead, and then we have the propeller. It's going to go in here. Then you usually have an, another bulkhead. And then you have a spinner that is going to go through all of this, except symmetrical. Well, you have to, when you install this stuff, you have to drill through and put screws here and screws there and screws here and screws here. But remember that the spinner's also got to be open at one spot to kind of fit around the, the hub, the cuff of the hub. So when you're actually installing a spinner, you have to locate these holes and you do your best to locate them exactly on the top as you would on the bottom or if you rotate right and left. But if they're off by just a little tiny bit, a 32nd of an inch, what happens is you try and bolt this on and you're going to get four or five screws on the top are going to work and all the ones on the bottom will work and these two won't. You know, and then the one on the front, you get a couple that will and a couple that won't. And you take it back off, rotate around. Oh, okay, now they all fit. So they just, because the holes are off just a tiny bit, you always want to put them back exactly. Otherwise, the spinner can move too much. Spinners are insanely expensive. Uh, my spinner developed a crack on my 150, which has got to be the smallest spinner there is. And used ones were $1,500. <clears throat> I think new, new was insanely expensive. Uh, what am I at? Don't forget spinner bulkheads. Good transition. I don't know why this is typical position. That should be, oh yeah, there we go. Um, don't forget bulkheads. Why do I say don't forget? <clears throat> because it's all too common to see somebody put a bolt on, get all six bolts through, safety them, get it all set, all happy, grab the spinner, go to put it on, and realize you know, the bulkheads went on before the prop and before the bolts. Um, bulkheads, torque in proper pattern. By that, I mean, don't come up to a prop and put all the six bolts in and say, okay, I'm going to tighten this one all the way, then the next one all the way. You got to go around, it, you know, star pattern or, or something. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. So don't come up to this one and say, well, the torque is, you know, 360 inch pounds. So I'm just going to do this one to 360, then I'll do this one to 360, and I'll do that one to 360. If you have a wood prop, first of all, that's way too much for a wood prop, but if you go to the max torque on a wood prop on this one and you go to the max top on this one, you will hear the wood crunching as you do it. And that's okay. By the time you get to this one, you'll probably realize that you need to take off the prop and have it reworked or replaced because it will crush it crooked. So you do this one very lightly and this one very lightly and then this one and this one. So this one, one, two, three four, five, six, kind of a star pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six. So in a pattern similar to that and do it in. So when I did wood props, I did it like, I, would, I only use, I use my quarter inch wrench and just go kind of just barely snug with the quarter inch wrench and do that. Then I would get out the next wrench and go a little more. And then, and uh, I want to say the torque on a wood prop is somewhere around 125 inch pounds. It's not much, it's really low. Um, safety. Safety with proper safety wire. Uh, care to guess what the size is? Point what? 
Well, I hear 040 and I hear 041. Well, if you want to be technical, Sensenit says 040 and Macaulay says 041. So I guess if you only had to buy one roll, you might want to buy 041. Hey, we got our taper crank. We talked about this in 310. So because it's a taper crank, it needs some sort of adapter. And the adapter is a tool. Not only is it an adapter, it's a tool. So when it's on proper, you can see how it's going to go on like that. What's funny about this right now? Bent. It's what? Bent. It's not bent, uh, but it's a good observation. It does appear bent. Rusty. Those are bolts. Number one, they're rusty and they shouldn't be. But they're bolts. What's wrong with the way those bolts are installed? Back. Are they, are they installed backwards? Yeah. That's proper for this installation. And the reason why is because there's very little room between the back of this adapter and the engine. So all you have room for is a washer and the head. If you turned it around, you'd have a washer, a bolt, cotter pin safety wire, and the rest of the bolt sticking out, a couple of threads, and it would wear back in there. So this is actually correct in that it's installed, the bolts are installed backwards on this. It even shows it right here, I just realized. So it goes backwards. Um, so you, you can put this on, it's got, uh, it's keyed, so it only goes on one way, slide the prop on, and there you go, put that on. All right, but what's, uh, I heard this story, and it wasn't, it's not first-hand, but second-hand story. This particular, eh, this isn't a great drawing, but this spins, this does not, when you're installing it, all right, when, when it's running, it all spins. So this particular piece on the outside is locked in place with this ring so that there's a groove in there and that ring goes in there and you've got these little holes right in there that would allow you to get a tool in there and kind of pop that ring and get the ring out so what a lot of people don't realize is that this is a tool when it's not being used to hold the, hold the prop on so you tighten it up in the direction of rotation and it tightens all this down with the taper crank but when you want to take it off what you do is you put a bar through these big fat holes right here and you loosen it so when you, it loosens so when it breaks free it's going to spin real easy and then as you keep going it's going to suddenly get really tight and what happened because it got tight is this big nut hit against that ring that's in there and now it's trying to back off and take the whole adapter off the crank with it and it's supposed to that's the tool to get it off so it's funny and, it, and somebody told a story about how they saw some poor guy you know they went to lunch and they saw some guy had, you know first of all it's hard to get that ring out it's really difficult i have one Can I show you guys? Remember this? I said, don't put your hands inside of it. <laughs> and I won't say it again. All right. And who was the guy who put his hands inside of it? So what's inside of it? Uh, Prussian blue is inside of it. All right. So this is loose on there. It's got the ring in there. And you can see the little holes right here where I might try to push that and get that ring out. But I'd never want to because it's really hard. And then you got to put it back in. So when you're tightening it, this tightens up and pushes this all on the prop. Then when I go to loosen it, ah, that loosens up. And it's going to be really loose. And as I go, it's going to get tight. Because it's hitting the ring and it's going to start pulling this right off the propeller. So it's a puller. So, and then it's got a big key in there. So it goes on one way. Don't put your fingers in there. And last but not least, these holes, the small holes here on this, those are to safety it to the propeller. So if we were to look at the propeller, see the safety holes? Right there. And so it takes a pin and the pin goes from the inside out. Why would it go from the inside out and not outside in? Centrifugal force. It's a, it's actually a um, clevis pin. You don't bend that. So pin or bolt or whatever goes inside out because if you lost the cotter pin part of it, it would still stay in. So you want to you want to put your hand? <laughs> What's the definition of insanity? I was going to say engaging Dennis in a conversation. 
<laughs> All right, taper crank. Taper crank. It uses an adapter. Sure. See so you can get blue fingers. Uh, we've got to abbreviate here, so let's see. Installation. Fit needs to be checked. And by that, what I'm saying is you have to make sure that enough of that adapter makes contact with the crank. And the way you do that is you put something inside called Prussian blue, which is the blue stuff in there. And somebody once told me the formula for how much Prussian blue you need. And it was something like, take out one quarter of what you think you need, get rid of half of that, and now you have too much. <laughs> so a little dab will do you. What movie is that from? You guys are too young for that one. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. <coughs> All right, so if you're watching this at home, uh, everything just went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, okay, so installation needs to be checked. Uh, check with Prussian blue. Check with P R U S S I A and Prussian blue. So you put the Prussian blue either on the crank or <clears throat> inside of that. Install, torque, pull it back off, and you're going to look at, so if you put the Prussian blue in the hub, don't put it on both pieces, all right? That would be wrong. So put it on one piece, the other one's dry, you put it together, torque it, take it off, and you're going to look at the one that was dry, and you're going to see where it transferred the blue ink. So now you can see if you put too much in there, it's just going to squish everywhere. And, ah, look, it's perfect. Um, so don't do that. And you need to have 70% contact area. Uh, if less than 70%, uh, clean and lap surfaces. What is lapping? You guys remember doing that with valves? All right, so you could take out the keyway, you could put some lapping compound in there and, and uh, polish it in place. Um, what else do I want to say here? Install with anti seize. So you always want to put some sort of anti-seize on that when you install it. The reason why is because if you get a little vibration going on in there, um, it's going to, number one, fret and it can seize up on there. I've had some aircraft people have brought in, you know, the first time I've done an annual and, and you can look through the log books and you can see the prop hasn't been removed in decades. It's good luck. Uh, I made a point of every time I did an annual on a customer's plane. So if they had a wood prop, I would retorque, I would re relax, retorque the wood prop. If it was a metal prop, at a minimum, I would take off the adapter. I would pop it off, clean it, re NICs, put it back on. And if it was a wood prop, I would do the same thing. Is there a uh, set amount of time that you would relax the prop for before you retorque everything? A wood prop? No, I just did it. Just take it off and just wait a little bit and I don't know, go to lunch, do it, just retorque it back. The point is if, if the, the prop was torqued when it was really dry and it got really humid, it's trying to swell. It is swelling and that bolts are getting really tight and it's crushing into the prop. It's not hurting the bolts, but it's crushing the prop. So just by relaxing it and then retorquing it properly, just that fast, you've relaxed everything and you've brought it back to a zero state and then retorqued it. So no, I didn't really wait. Yeah, I sat down, have a little cigarette, cup of coffee, boss comes by. What are you doing? I'm talking the prop, boss. <laughs> we done in an hour. Um, all right, spline shafts. Often have a master spline. Uh, 
um, which is right there. So I, think, I can just draw one. But uh, so the master spline, really, what it is, thank you, is simply one valley missing. So if you had a valley going all the way down, you'd see it would just look normal all the way around. <clears throat> and the reason for that is for indexing. Same thing. Sometimes you don't have a master spline that looks like that, but you'll have a little screw just stuck right there in between two, in the valley between two. And that's the master spline there. And then you'll have a corresponding item on the propeller hub, which you'd call the dead spline. And believe it or not, there's actually go, no go gauges. Go. Used to check splines. Because they can wear. And if you don't check them, then they get too small and that's bad. Um, so they do make go, no go gauges used to check the splines to make sure they're still within airworthy limits. Uh, which brings up a point I'm thinking about. Um, Juan and Josh did an excellent job getting the Skymaster going and they took and they went the extra mile and actually wrote a really nice log entry for the book. And so we actually had, it was a great conversation. We could talk about certain things to write, not to write. Um, you guys did an outstanding job. Um, but what was one of the things that we talked about, like checking something with a go, no-go gauge, or checking anything, you have to be careful what you write. Uh, you can't write that uh, checked and found good. Um, checked and found okay. Don't ever write stuff like that. If you check something, you know, check splines with a go, no-go gauge, and all splines were found to be in tolerance. Don't just say okay or good. I mean, write what you really mean there. They're within tolerance. Uh, you can get a little crazy about you know intolerance per uh, this book, chapter this, page such and such. You know revision this. But most of the time, when you're doing a lot of work, then you get to the end and then you say work performed in accordance with. Then you give your final uh, source on that. But you'll get more of that next year. Uh, okay, there are, this is going to be a confusing one. There are, I think, some Q&A questions about this. Install, the installation of spline shafts uses cones. The installation uses front and rear cones to center prop. On shaft. Am I right about that? There's some Q and A's about cones. Okay. And what that is, so we have the this particular engine is facing the aircraft is facing this way. So the front of the engine's over over in this side. And so what they're representing here is the, the engine thrust nut here. So the back of the engine's going this way over here. So here's the, the shaft, the propeller shaft sticking out. And so they have these cones that go, I have a cone. to go on the prop shaft. Hey, bigger arm. Where's that? Prince. So, and what that's going to do when the when the hub comes on, it allow it pushes up against this. And if and of course you should have pressure blue, you should have a contact area with this. And then there's also one on the front so they come in together and they're going to uh, center the prop. So, as you can see in this drawing right here, what happened with this particular installation is the prop hub is coming on here and it actually made contact right here, the front right here. And that's bad, right? Because it didn't actually sit against here. And so what's going to happen is this is going to wear a little bit and then you're going to, because of the space, now you're going to have a loose prop on there. So you want to make sure that number one, it, it, it sets properly on the rear cone. 
Then it's going to be another one on the front. So I think it's the front. Front. Okay, so the front. Um, as you tighten up the nut on the front, you're going to be tightening up against a cone, and the cone should actually reach in there and fit nicely. So you got to make sure that the cones touch. So the way that you do it is you put in a little Prussian blue on your cones, you torque it together, you take it apart, and you make sure that the, you had a transfer of the Prussian blue uh, on both surfaces. Uh, what do you think the uh, contact area is going to be? 70 percent all right so how can we remember that well what's passing for a test 70 percent so same thing so we have now established that as long as that 70 percent is the passing for for aviation quality work right so if you have so, so if you have have four bolts and one bolt breaks off that's okay right <laughs> Because that's that's seventy five percent. You're halfway to a B. <laughs> I did my math correctly, so don't worry about stuff like that. Yes, unless I give you the answers ahead of time, then it's got to be eighty. But all right, so this is what's going on here with these these uh, these cones. All right, so we got to have the cones on the prop shaft. Let me see. Um, use Prussian blue. To, ver to verify 70% contact. All right, if you have rear coning bottom, rear, rear coning, rear, I'm sorry, rear cone bottoming, It must be corrected. Rear cone bottoming must be corrected. So if we had this happen in the rear, what, what could I do to fix that? Yeah, different cone. Cone's got to be, uh, it's got to fit better. Rear point contact and the step and the hub's rear taper. So you're going to have to change out that cone. You got to get it up there more. I can't see that. Can't grind this away uh, because it's in the hub. Um, so it's just what happens when they start getting a little worn out. I've never had this problem. Is the thing, but front coning. Let's say front cone. This is more likely where you're going to have the problem. Front cone bottoming. May happen. If the cone hits the splines before contact with the hub. So what I'm saying there is that in this, here's the spline and you can see that there's actually no space so this cone has gone all the way up and the flat edge is, is, is hitting the spline. Now, you got to think, is that actually putting any pressure on the hub? So when you're tightening the hub nut, what are you actually doing? You're compressing the cone against the spline and the actual prop hub can be loose in there and rattling around. But you're like, hey, but I torqued it. So is it tight? Mm -hmm. No. Hey, Kevin, is this the best picture you have of the hub? Yeah, and I had to kind of search kind of hard for this one. Sorry. Or maybe I didn't search hard enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so what can I do to correct this? Um, no, because even no matter how, how I change the cone, it's going to hit here before it hits there. The answer is to space this. So if I space out the rear cone, put spacers behind the rear cone, then I move the entire hub forward, and then the hub tightens up against here so that you have a space right here. You space out your rear cone? Uh-huh. Does it help that rear cone problem? No, it's just going to move it forward, so it just brings this whole problem forward more. It's kind of a hard one to explain, uh, probably because the pictures kind of suck and I'm not really good at drawing. 
So let me see, front cone body may happen if the cone hits the splines before contact with the hub. Um, if this happens, move the rear cone forward. Space it. And if you don't do this and the hub is loose on there, it's going to gall and shake and be loose. So don't do that. No matter what you do, no matter what prop it is, no matter how it's installed on the aircraft, when you install a propeller on the aircraft, you need to check tracking. Tracking is making sure that both blades come to the exact same path. If you have a wood prop and you did the thing where you tighten the first bolt all the way, then you went to the second bolt all the way and went around like I told you not to, you'll actually take the prop and you're going to put it off center a little bit. Then when you go to track it, you realize that the prop should be sitting square to the aircraft, but it's not. It's kind of turned off to one way and that's going to really shake things up. So blade tracking. I've never done it with the cowling fixture. But this, uh, this drawing cracks me up a little bit. And I'll tell you why. So <clears throat> this one's kind of cool in that if you really look carefully what they did, they took a wood block that's a little bit taller than the bottom of the blade. And so, uh, but the blade's twisted. So it's kind of, you got to pick the right spot and mark it. So you're going to mark it as a blade's here. Then you're going to rotate the engine and bring it around. It's really hard to do this if you have spark plugs in the engine because you're fighting the compression. And if you only have allowed plus or minus a sixteenth of an inch, it's really hard to not move an aircraft a sixteenth of an inch if it's got a good compression. So you got to do it without spark plugs in. But here's the funny part. So every class does this. <laughs> you got the prop. And the prop comes oh about you know foot off the ground. They go, well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta mark that. And so you go around running around through the whole shop looking for just the right amount of wood to get it just underneath the propeller. See, so you, you know, you got a block of wood, a block of wood, a textbook, a couple pieces of sheet metal, a laptop, and then another thing and a piece of paper. Like, yeah, we did it. You know? All right. Think three dimensionally. So here we are, you know, you got the prop coming down, we'll just kind of do like this. And so, you know, you're, and here's the floor. And so, yeah, you got, you know, a block of wood and, you know, another block of wood and a, your textbook and a coffee cup and, you know, and then, you know, a couple Legos trying to get in there and you're just trying to get it just right. Well, you know what, in a three dimensional world, so now we'll look at the front of the propeller. Instead of trying to figure out exactly it's not the floor, just grab a stool or something and just bring the prop like this. <laughs> right. So you can just find anything in the shop that's tall enough and just, well, that's maybe wrong drawing there, so let's see, erase that. We'll get rid of my little stool. But if the prop's like this, just, just grab something that's Kind of yay tall. I don't know why it did that. And bring it up next to the prop or move the prop. You guys follow what I'm saying? Okay. It's hard to, to do this on here so people can see it watching the video. But you don't always have to go directly underneath. You can go off to the side with something that's nearly any height. And that actually works. And it's very quick. <laughs> How long did you spend looking for enough wood to do? He did get it really close. You, sh you should have seen it. It was like a Jenga pile over there. <laughs> And how long did it take you to get that stack of wood? Like Ten minutes, yeah. <laughs> then they got mad. I'm like, why did you just use this? I grabbed something and stuck it right there like that. They're like, seriously? <laughs> Go away. Because <laughs> they wanted to leave it and set up little cones and caution tape around it so nobody would touch it over the thing tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Use a laser level? Okay, so you could bolt a laser level to the prop, but you'd have to have two of them. 
Well, you're, you're trying to make sure the pa the tips are coming through the exact same plane. What you're talking about is like uh, along the line of rotation, but like away from the prop, so that you can see how far if it, if the prop comes down and touches the laser <coughs> level, then you know it's tracking one way or the other. Sure. Right. But you have to have your laser level calibrated. calibrated. My stool is. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> See that sticker right there? <laughs> it's calibrated. It doesn't have to be calibrated. All right, so check tracking after installation. Um, let's see, Blade, it ensures, so that is, oh, I'm trying to abbreviate here. Um, to ensure that not all, but both, all blades, all blades track in the same plane. I, the I knew somebody was going to do that. <laughs> and I felt that it would be from those two rows, too. <laughs> same plane of rotation. Max allowable out of track is one sixteenth inch, sixteenth for metal, one eighth for wood. And if it's out, you can actually correct it with shims. behind the prop. All right, that brings us to the break.